Hello, uh, I'm Danielle Dart of the Minnesota Historical Society. Welcome to today's program, Knowing Our Worth, Immigrant and Refugee Changemakers, the first in a series of three. In this extraordinary year, the Minnesota Historical Society is marking the centennial of the 19th Amendment, the passage of which was an enormous accomplishment that nonetheless failed to extend voting rights to and expand democratic participation amongst Asian Pacific Islander, Latinx, African American, and Native American women. In acknowledgement of that history and in light of our current political moment, we are offering this series, which will convene three conversations between Asian Pacific Islander, Somali, Latinx, African American, and Native American women who are leading in community and advocating for positive social and political change in Minnesota today. Before we begin our conversation, it is important to remind ourselves that every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. We can begin to acknowledge this history by honoring the truth. We are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. We pay respects to their elders past and present. And as you listen to today's conversation, I hope you will consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that have brought us together in this place. And now I'll hand things over to our moderator, Kim Heikola. She is a historian who focuses on oral histories and women's histories. Kim, take it away. All right, thanks, Danielle. And welcome to everyone who is joining us online, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube. It's nice to know you're out there, even if we can't quite see you. So welcome. Um, I am really honored to be a part of a program with three such accomplished community organizers and activists. Their work to pervert, preserve and expand our democracy is especially important as we approach one of, if not the most critical elections of our time, certainly of my lifetime. So we'll hear about the importance of the vote, of preserving access to the vote for those who already have the legal right to it, and of extending access to the vote for those who don't. But our democracy, our nation's future, and our national identity are shaped by more than just the vote, as important as it is. So we'll also have a chance to think and hear about other ways that we participate in the life of the nation, other ways that we can help, help it live up to its highest ideals or to change those ideals if they need changing, and other ways we can create or express a sense of belonging. And more specifically, we'll have a chance to hear from three people who are born elsewhere, came to the United States as children, and have dedicated themselves to doing this work. So I'm gonna introduce each of our panelists very briefly because then I'm going to have them each introduce themselves in more depth and on their own terms. But I do want to make sure that we all know who is in the room, the virtual room with us. So I will introduce each of them very brief, briefly. So Vanjie Castro was born in the Philippines and emigrated to the United States at age three with their family in the late 1970s. They now live in Rochester and are a community organizer an LGBTQ plus rights activist and a former candidate for the Rochester City Council president, as well as a former organizer for Fair Vote Minnesota, which advocates for ranked choice voting, which I talked to Vanji about at some length about a year ago or a little bit less. Nimo Farah was born in Mogadishu, Somalia in the 1980s. She fled the Somali civil war with her family, lived in a Kenyan refugee camp for a while before eventually resettling in Minnesota when she was a young child. She's a storyteller, artist, orator, published poet, and co-founder of the Somali Arts, Language, and Leadership Institute, as well as an artist organizer for the People's Center Clinics and Services and a former Bush Fellow. So welcome to Nima. And Carolina Ortiz was born in Zacatecas, Mexico, and brought to the United States by her mother when she was also a small child. She is a DACA recipient and is also the communications director, director for Communities Organizing Latinx Power and Action, or COPAL. She's also the founder of Mirame, Look at Me, a collective civic art project that shares individual stories from the local Latino immigrant community, and she's a longtime community activist. So welcome, especially to all three of you. We're really happy to have you here and, and eager to hear, hear from and about you. 
Um, <clears throat> before we before we get into the discussion, before I ask you all to introduce yourselves in your, on your own terms, I just want to encourage those of you who are out there on Facebook or even um, YouTube to go ahead and submit your questions as they arise in your mind through the chat feature, through the comment feature on whatever platform you're using. Um, don't we will have time for a Q&A at the end of the discussion, but you don't have to wait and hope that you'll remember the question that might arise for you in the first 10 minutes of, of the program. So you can submit those questions as they come up for you and we'll collect and compile them and then use them for the Q&A at the end of the session. So um, I'm gonna pose the first question to launch the discussion and panelists, if you can just make sure that you are all unmuted so we can hear you. Um, I'm going to just throw this out there and ask you this question by way of introduction. What do we need to know about you to understand who you are? What do we need to know about you to understand who you are? Carolina, would you like to start? I would love to. Thank you so much for, for having us here today. and We're super excited. Um, but I think something that you need to know about me um, is that I am a DACA recipient and everything that I do is because of my current status and also because of my community. Um, I've been working or volunteering and being part uh, socially in, in the community since I was nine. And that is again, because um, there is a lot of things that I I couldn't do, so I had to find other ways. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit about me. Vanjie, how about you? Uh, okay, so I, what people need to know about me, and I think sometimes people assume is that I'm not an immigrant, that I actually was born in the Philippines. Um, my family came here and they were, my mom and dad were in their 40s when they were forced to have to come to the United States. I'm a naturalized citizen. I became naturalized when I was 18. And um, ever since I've been able to vote, I voted in all of the elections. Um, but also that I actually really wasn't very engaged until really until I was in my 30s. I'm now 46. Um, I think it takes you know, when you're when you're an immigrant or a refugee, I think that most of the time you're focusing on really trying to work towards uh, being part of uh, the American system versus being an activist or, or being socially engaged. And so I, I think it's that's really what um, people should know about something a little bit about me. Great, thanks, Nima. Nemo? Oh, oh dear, we lost her. Okay, well, we'll um, we'll just move on, and when Nemo pops back in, we'll come back to her and and have her answer that same question, so she can introduce herself. Um, so I kind of like to shape the discussion today around <clears throat> the categories, um, the title of the program itself, which is immigrant and refugee change makers. So I'd like to to ask all of you, when assuming Nemo comes back, to tell us a little bit about where you and your families come from. And I know for, for many, oh, here we go. Oh, there she is. Hi, Nemo. You're back, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm uh, here. I was just, okay. Okay. Oh, it's it's I, Can you guys hear I me get okay? It. We can hear you. So yeah, now if you wanna go ahead and, and answer that question about what do we need to know about you to understand who you yeah, are? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Oh. Hmm. We may have lost you again, Nemo. Can you hear me okay? Now, now we can. And I can see you now as well. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's really different. Um. Are you there at all? All right, we might have to do some technical intervention for Nemo or she might have to, you might, um, 
Vanji suggested that maybe you just try to use your sound instead of the, the video, so that might make an easier connection. Um, but I'm going to go back then to Vanji. I'll, we'll start with you this time, Vanji, and just ask you to tell us a little bit about where you and your family came from. And what I was going to say is that, you know, I recognize that some of these, um, these stories about where you came from might come from your family as much as from yourselves because you were so young when you came. So mm -hmm. if you could just start by telling us a little bit about your family and, and where you came from. Um. So I was born in uh, Sambuanga City uh, in the Philippines, and it's kind of um, in the central, south central parts of the, the Philippines. And my dad at the time, you know, he worked for a bank. Uh, he graduated college and became a certified public accountant. Um, and at the time, the reason from what I've been told from my family since I was only like three or four years old when we came here, uh, is that the his workplace uh, got bombed, and that uh, if we didn't leave, then my father probably either would have gotten arrested or um, killed. And so it was, uh, a, you know, we came for political asylum uh, in at the late in the late seventies when uh, uh, there was martial law going on in the Philippines at the time, and it was much safer for us to to immigrate to the United States than to stay. Um, and I, I think what's important for people to know is like a lot of folks that leave their home country usually don't want to leave. And it's sometimes forced if there's like civil war, drought, things like that, um, that's happening to force people out of their home. But for the most part, you know, just like anybody, I don't think anybody wants to leave their home if they don't have to. Yeah. And, and that actually might be a really good segue back to you, Nemo. <laughs> yeah, I see I you there. Want, you know, there are like, I, I think multiple people stream in the same place uh, where I am. So yeah, yeah. Um, I apologize and thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we were just, yeah, we can just go back and have you introduce yourselves. We haven't gotten much beyond that anyway. So yes, if you I can just tell us on my phone what we yep what we need to know about you to understand who you are maybe a little bit about where you and your family came from are you there uh oh all right so maybe she's switching to her phone so carolina let's let's go back to you <laughs> um if you could tell us a little bit too about where you and your family came from and why you came to the United States. Yes, um, so I was born in, in Zacatecas, Mexico, and that's also um, where my parents are from. And um, I had, I actually had a medical condition that didn't allow me to, to walk uh, when I was a child. And my parents, you know, were living in poverty. And of course we, we I mean, we barely had enough food for, I mean, money for food, yet alone like medical treatment or anything else. So um, my my dad decided to, you know, not knowing what he would find on this side, just give it a shot. And he they really wanted a better future for me. They wanted to give me an opportunity. And that is something that I will always be grateful for because they, they risked their lives. They, I mean, crossing the border, and not knowing if you're going to make it, not knowing what you'll find, I just just thinking about it, it's it's terrifying. And Vanji, like you said, nobody wants to leave their home. Like my parents left their their parents, my grandma, my grandpa, their brothers and sisters, their language, their food, everything behind, and they did that big sacrifice because they they wanted a better future for 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 me and for my brother. And um, I I mean. I, I, they're my heroes. They're my heroes, and I am here today because of them. Um, and I'm always trying to to do the best that I can uh, to make sure that you know their their sacrifice was was worth it. See you again, Nemo. <laughs> You're muted. Uh, I, there okay, we go. So I, I've, I've unmuted myself. <laughs> You know, in terms of um, introducing myself, I will just go back to that. Um, my my name is Nemo. Um, in Somali, it's pronounced Nimro, and sometimes Naima. 
um, it, it's the name of a heaven, but it could also mean comfort and happiness. So I think I try to embody that as best as I can. Um, I was born in Somalia, but I grew up in South Minneapolis. Um, and I think one of my, I, I feel like I could never see something going wrong and not want to do anything about it. I'm one of those people that has always felt like if I, if I can be helpful, I will be helpful. If I could be a witness, I'm going to be a witness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, that's mainly who I am. Um, and that's what got me into community organizing and um, just like uh, wanted to be a, comp- a more compassionate human being. Okay. And how old were you when you came, you came with your family to the United States? Nine. Nine? Yeah. Okay. And did you come to Minnesota right away? It's by way of Virginia, my parents had friends in in um in the DC Virginia kind of area like that. But when you're a refugee and everybody that you've known is accepting family, you end up having to figure out what to do. And so one of my mom's best friends slash cousin, who's also my second mom, lived here. So okay. this is how we ended up in Minnesota. Okay. So all of you were children when you came to the United States um, and Vanjie yeah. and you grew up primarily in, in California. Yeah. But, um, children, do you, what, ch- ch- children, children in age, but not in experience. Right, right. Certainly a different, you were having very different life experiences by age three, four, and nine than, yeah. than I was yeah. as somebody who was born and raised here. So, yeah. so ta- and Nemo, you might be able to answer this question a little bit more directly than Carolina and Vanjie because you were a little bit older, but what do you either remember yourself or did you hear later from your parents about um, making that adjustment to life in the United States? What was that like for you and your family? So Nima, why don't you go ahead and start and then we can. I think a, a, a lot of my memories is me trying to unpack with my parents rather than trying to have every once in a while, a while my mom or my dad would have a moment where they wanna, cause I've always been, uh, I would say a weird kid. <laughs> and so um, so they would have moments where they want to remind me of something that I did or said, but most times it'd be me asking them questions like, this happened, what was going on around it, just for me to um, gain context. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's trying to unpack for me personally. Um, yeah. And then also trying to remember because I have very early um, childhood memories and I have always wanted to understand them. So I asked both my siblings and my parents all the time, like, what was happening? <laughs> Who did that and that? What was so-and-so's name? Because you could like see a face, but you cannot put a name to it. Right. right. And then it's like, how are they related to us? So it's a lot of, it's a lot of remembering. It's a lot of unpacking. Mm-hmm. Um, but then... I feel like sometimes I have to remind them also because, you know, like memory is one of these things where something is blocking it. Yeah. And so it takes someone else to just be like, hey, I have this memory and it, it hit me the other day. There's something that that happened. And then it it becomes a floodgate for someone else. Mm-hmm. Were there any particular memories that you have that stand out from your you know your young life as you were making the transition here to the United States or to Minnesota? Everything, it's it's so scary and so wonderful. And then it's also one of these things where you had an expectation, but then the expectation is not fulfilled. What were you expecting? <laughs> so there's like a certain, oh, so I, I don't know if it's part of my bio that I, re, I grew up in a refugee camp literally right before I came here. And so for some reason, there are all these like advertisement magazines at the refugee camp with like roller skates and bicycles and just like really happy kids. And so that's what I wanted. But then we arrived in 1994 in September, but it was snowing. It was so cold. <laughs> none, none of anything that I imagined was happening. So I'm like, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> false advertising. Fanji, how about you? Completely false advertisement, huh? <laughs> Benji, how about you? What, what, um, either what do you remember 
experiencing yourself as a child or hearing from your family about their adjustment to, the, to life in the United States or to California mostly for you? Well, yeah, when we first came to the United States, we came through Minnesota. Um, and and from what I remember is that my mom really didn't like the snow. <laughs> and so when we had an opportunity to either stay in Minnesota or move to California where we had some family, my uh, dad had uh, taken the CPA exam in California and Minnesota and passed in both. And we chose to come to California and that's where I grew up basically. Um, and I just remember that the, er the early parts of growing up is is us um, living in a two bedroom apartment, uh, you know, sharing one bedroom with two sisters and my brother sleeping on the couch. And, and knowing that, you know, even though that we may have been growing up in poverty, I never really felt that way um, because, you know, we had a warm meal every night. We were close knit. We had a community. Um, which was really great about California is that there is a large Filipino population. So we were able to still, you know, celebrate our heritage and, and be with people who looked like us and, and eat the same food as us. Uh, so that was really, really a great part about, you know, growing up in California. Um, and so, you know, I think just knowing that my parents worked really, really hard uh, to make a better life for us. And um, we moved out of that two bedroom apartment into a, a, a home eventually. Um, and I think that's kind of says a lot about, you know, the, 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 you know, the resiliency that folks have who are immigrants and, and refugees to be able to do a lot with basically nothing. Sometimes we came here with whatever was in our suitcases. Yeah. Carolina, how about you? What was your family's experience in adjusting to life here? These memories are always a little bit hard for me to talk about. Um, I, I remember, you know, even though I was really little, I remember my mom losing all of her hair um, because of all of the stress that came with um, coming to the United States. She was very, very thin. She lost all of her hair completely. And I remember her scars. Like I remember seeing her body in pain because of everything that she had to go through. Um, I also have memories of, you know, them, like I, I didn't, I remember not knowing English. And I remember coming home with like a book from school and saying, hey mom, guess what? You know, I just learned these new words in English. And that to me was a pretty big deal. And honestly, I probably made some up. Like I was probably pretending to know more than I did because I wanted to be that translator for her. Like I wanted to be that person to defend her when things happened and also to be able to communicate with people what she wanted to communicate because I would see her struggle. And I think as... Uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay, Carolina, we lost you a little bit, but it's interesting. So I'm gonna talk while we wait for her to come back because it was interesting. Um, you know, what Carolina was just saying reminded me of what you said earlier, Nemo, about how, you know, uh, children who come to the United States as refugees or as immigrants um, in these circumstances where, you know, like you said earlier, Vanjie, you don't wanna leave home, but you're forced to, you grow up really quickly. And you, you um, have a lot more responsibility than a lot of other kids at that same age. Um, and so I was, I was hearing Carolina say something very similar to what, to what you had said, Nemo, about that earlier. Now, she, now Carolina's gone, so hopefully she'll come back. She, she'll, she'll be back. I guess I had that moment earlier, yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the world we live in right now. It happens. Um, so, so I wanted to ask you though, too, and, and Banji, you talked about this already a little bit. So Nemo, and you can certainly expand and, and um, I'd like to hear that from Nemo too and Carolina when she comes back. How did you find community when you got here? How did you find community? And, and whatever that means to you, how did you find community when you got to this new and strange place? Is that question directed? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. 
so this is one of the most phenomenal things actually because I've lived in Minnesota for so long and just I think part of um history I'm not a historian but like I I do like to observe and from a very early on like as a kid I just I, I liked observing and one of the most important things that I observed as a child was this like when we came to Minnesota, everybody was like our either second auntie or second mommy, or like if you saw a Somali person, do you either gave them a right? We all went grocery shopping together. It was such a small community that we like what um Menji was describing in that like that close knitness, like so close because you you you're in this place where it's like ooh, we don't know what's going on, but we're gonna make it and we're gonna help each other figure this out. And so I remember that from a very early age in that like, when we went grocery shopping, like my family particularly, um, there's this one uncle that helped us, but then he helped so many other people. Um, mm. And then there, the other part of, um, yeah, I grew up Muslim. So the other part is the shared space of going to the masjid but then there wasn't a mosque, like there wasn't a masjid, but there was just like a spiritual gathering place. It was just a random building. It did not look like the kind of masjid that you grew up with. It's just like, okay, this looks like a warehouse. <laughs> but you know what? You put your spirit into it and you make it into a spiritual place. And so I remember people gathering there and like, you know, as um, at the kids, learning the Quran and like women just congregated. It's, for me, that was like community growing up. And sometimes I would get help with my homework while I was there. Or like somebody would um, tell me about this like audio tape in which I, I'm nine years old, 10 years old. But I remember falling asleep to like English audio tapes. That was like the most fascinating thing to me. I went to the library and got this audience. I'm like, I don't know who John, John, who's this, Samantha, these people, <laughs> they're having a conversation. But I'm like, I'm going to listen to this with my little cassette that I borrowed from the library because somebody at the mosque or this place that I went to told me about it. Mm -hmm. And then I could just kind of see their conversation. And this is sort of how I learned English. Okay. So, I was like, and this is literally what I was little, little. As a teenager, I'm like, I'm way too cool for this. I, I can't be bothered. But like, when you're nine yeah. and old, listening to John and Samantha in an audio tape, <laughs> like walkie talkie, it's weird. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, and, and so that that um, leads me to this question. And Vanji, you kind of alluded to this as well. How did you and your families, so I'm, I'm always, you know, going to expand this to your family experience as well, not just your individual experience, but how did you and your family manage to find a balance between, um, you know, finding communities that represented the places that you came from, the Filipino community, the Somali community, while also trying to become part of the American community or the California community or Minnesota, you know, the, the community into which you all had moved. How did you, yeah. how did you find that, try to strike that balance? I, I'm so curious to hear about this what? from Benji. Take, it, <laughs> take, take this. <laughs> well, um, so to, uh, today or yesterday I actually started uh, Filipino American uh, History Month. Um, and one of the things that I think a lot of people don't know um, of course, or, or maybe they did learn in, in, in school was you know, the Philippines was conquered uh, by Spain uh, by Ferdinand Magellan in 1521. And we were a colony for over 300, almost like 377 years. And so as, a, as, as people who have been colonized, we have this like innate ability to be able to assimilate, I guess. And so, mm -hmm. And how you do that is when you're coming to a new country, you have to find folks who have similar experiences as, as you. And I think that's why a lot of folks um, from the Philippines came to California. One, the weather is, is very, it's 
warm. <laughs> <laughs> the Philippines is in, uh, in the tropics. Um, so, you know, and, and also we do have a very uh, strong familial culture. You know, we're not an individualistic culture to begin with. Also, um, we're Catholic. And that was a, a, one of the bonds that we were able to do to, that we had was go to church. Um, so we went to Catholic church and that's where we met a lot of folks. Uh, but also the Filipino American community is, is, was very large and strong. And so there was like a, like a club, like the Filipino American uh, club. And there's a couple of them actually around the nation. And they're, they're really focused on celebrating our, our culture, our heritage. I mean, I remember, you know, going to tons of gatherings with lots of other Filipino families with food. I mean, food is what binds us <laughs> sometimes and brings us together. The idea of creating relationships and breaking bread and, and sharing shared experiences, I think really uh, helps strengthen communities, especially um, immigrant refugee communities. Yeah. Carolina. Welcome back. Wow. <laughs> so we were, we were just talking about um, how you and your family managed to find and build community once you got to the United States or to Minnesota. So if you want to say a few words about that, that'd be great. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that really helped um, was that like I was always really involved like in high school activities like I would sign up for every program that I could possibly find that sounded interesting and I think that was a way for me to just cope with everything going on and feel like I was keeping my mind busy and and just focusing on on what I could and um, apart from that like you know I would always make sure to include my family like any any events I would always include my parents because I wanted to the, for them to also feel like they were part of what I was finding to be part of. Um, something um, apart from school that was church. Um, I have met like amazing mentors. Uh, Rico, he's been my mentor since I was nine um, from the church group that I was in. And of course, I would also include my my mom and my dad and you know have them come and I think it, I really was just in search of like where where can you know we we help where can we spend our time how can we keep keep each other busy and just build a family that we don't have because it's really I only have one cousin here <laughs> that's family mm -hmm. so it's it was I mean we're still very very small. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so Caroline, I'm gonna. Um, ask you to talk a little bit because you said I think in your introduction even and, and I know this from our previous conversation as well that you became really active like in terms of um, engaging in activities to make your community a better place to make lives better tell me a little bit about when you first got involved in something like that I think I, I um and I'm thankful that my parents were always very straightforward with everything going on. Um, I mean, since I was little, I would go and work with my mom because she would clean houses. And that would be not because, I mean, she wanted me there like all the time, but we couldn't afford, like she didn't, you know, couldn't take me to daycare. Or there wasn't anybody else that could help her with, with me. Um, so I, I would always see it like I would see my mom going to a house and being treated poorly because of her English. I would, um, you know, later see my dad like not getting paid for cer certain things. Um, then in high school, like middle school, high school, my parents not being able to have a license or, you know, medical insurance and all of these things like they were always all of these injustices I, I was living through like since I was very, very young. So I always felt like I, I knew that I had to do something. I just couldn't figure out how I could change things, like how I could make it better. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I feel like I, I found a way and I, I found my power and the power of my community as I was searching for an answer. Um, so I think it's, it's really just everything going on since I was a child that was that push for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Nemo, you said earlier too, when you were introducing yourself, that you're just the kind of person who, 
you know, you see something that needs fixing and you're going to, you're going to fix it or help fix it. So how did you um, tell us a little bit about how you became, you know, how you first got involved in kind of community organizing work? Um, so here's, here's the weird thing also about being an immigrant kid um, is that you could be like, you, you get involved in so much and Carolina, uh, mention this. It's like you sort of get involved in everything um, in terms of activities, but then when it comes to activism, everything is so related and like there is intersections between everything. So it's like you can, it's hard to compartmentalize when it comes to issues. Um, and so it's like uh, my background is a lot in economic development. However, I'm involved in arts a lot. And I've always found, and then now I'm doing work with health. Um, for me personally, I don't see it at different issues. I, I, it's just everything is related. Um, especially when it comes to people of color, um, anybody who is living with any of the poverty lines. And so I came into activism when I, probably first when I was in high school maybe the, the 10th grade, when I was in the 10th grade, I had like my first high school walkout. I was like, there's some issue going on. We're having a protest. <laughs> that was like the first time probably that I remember. And um, one of my teachers was like, Nemo, you sure you want to do this? Because I was like in a lot of like different activities that required a lot of me to be like this stand up person. <laughs> like something some injustice like I, I'd much rather do this than sit in a classroom <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's I, sort of how I became an organizer and then after that it was just like um I am I'm, 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 I think it's also really significant and important to understand activism in your own um personal life and in your mind it cannot be what you read in a textbook. It cannot be, it has to be very relevant to you. Um, and sometimes it starts with your individual life and then your family and then, you know, like whoever that's near you. Sometimes there are all these um, big ideas that end up hijacking what we believe as acti activism or and or organizing. Then you feel like you have to identify with that. And then what you're doing doesn't uh, feel relevant or important. Hmm. Interesting. Banji, do you want to you want to pick up the conversation either either from, you know, what Nemo has just said or about your own early experiences as an activist or an organizer? I know it was it also happened when you were in, you know, school too, young. Yeah. Well, yeah, so um I I identify a, a part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um I came out when I was uh in high school. And so I think that's where a lot of my activism started. And it was in the early 90s. Um, so HIV AIDS was, you know, an epidemic at, at the time, which is interesting when we're talking about pandemics and epidemics. Um, and I think I, you know, as a young person, I didn't really think of it as activism. I think it was more about uh, advocating for myself and my ability to exist and be in the world uh, safely, right? Um, and to have rights, have equal rights, and 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 you know, I didn't really understand, of course, at that age, what equity meant. But I knew that injustice was happening to people in the LGBTQ plus community. And I think um, if I didn't have the network, the social network that I had with my friends that also identified identified part of the the queer community, um, you know. I probably wouldn't have been as involved. And I think some people don't go into activism, like I'm gonna become a, you know, a social justice warrior. Um, I think they have friends that are like, I'm going to a rally, you wanna come with me? And then when they go and they hear a message that that resonates and speaks to them, and they realize like, yes, you know, my liberation is reliant on your liberation and your liberation is reliant on my liberation. and. And that's the, also the idea of like, and you had asked earlier about, you know, as um, an LGBTQ plus activist and, and um, 
and working for voting rights uh, and um, the intersection of immigrants and people of color and uh, gender identity and things like that. Like all of that comes together when we're talking about fighting for any kind of equity, any kind of social justice, um, and especially when we're talking about voting rights, uh, which, you know, the root of democracy is our ability to, to have a vote and have a voice. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I could also add to that, like, you know, I really wasn't very political until college, um, where you go to get become a liberal snowflake. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I took a political science class and I realized the importance of our civic duty and, and being civically engaged um, and the vote. And because, you know, when I learned about um, the women's moving towards uh, suffrage and the way that, that the women fought so long to get the right to vote, you know, of course, white middle-class women um, who first was, was able to get the right to vote, uh, it made me realize like if people are denying folks the ability to vote, that must be a big deal. That must be something that we really should be fighting for if there's so many people in power that are keeping us from voting. So hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there, there are so many ways we could go with this conversation. So many interesting issues you've all raised and we don't have four days to do it, unfortunately. But, but I do wanna ask one question. As I listen to all of you talk, you know, you're talking very much about how your activism, however you define it, has really sprung from your own very personal experiences of, of yourself, of your families, of your communities, and how that, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily think of yourself as, well, I'm gonna be a, a warrior for social justice now when you're nine or 16, but you're doing the things that matter to you or that your friends are doing. Um, but then, Vanjie, you're talking about the women's suffrage movement, and we all know that, you know, those women were advocating for themselves, but they were white middle-class women. And so there is something about um, a question I want to ask about how you both um, work for change on your own behalf and then also how do you do that on behalf of justice for others? In other words, how do you, how do you find allies, if we're going to use that term, or... or um, you know, you all you all share this experience of being immigrants and or refugees, but you all come from very different histories, different backgrounds. You have different racial identities in the United States. So how how do we make change? We the big collective we um, across those kinds of communal or cultural differences. Anyone, I'll I'll throw that out there to anyone who wants to take that one on, <laughs> or I'll or I'll ask somebody specifically. You know, Caroline, since I'm older, I'll take this. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> I'm going to act like a grandma right now. <laughs> um, the most important thing about this is that um, we're not here to fix anybody's issues. Like, um, as, as, uh, as, as much as you want to expand your heart and like your willingness to take care of the world, you, first of all, you take care of yourself, you take care of the ones that you see, like you focus on your own experience. Um, nobody is here, particularly, um, I would say number one, black woman, number two, women of color are not here to save anybody. So with that aside, um, if anybody wants to be inspired, I would say, number one, reference where your inspiration comes from. If you get inspired by a woman of color or a black woman, make sure you refer, and you know this as a, a historian, uh, it's like, okay, this is where, um, it did not come to you in a dream. You saw this. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you heard this somewhere. Reference, I think referencing is beautiful and referencing creates beautiful relationships also. So I would say that um, it, there, there is so much that has already been said and done mm -hmm. that something has to be done about it. Um, mm -hmm. And like there's, and it, there needs to be like some kind of like growth that happens within that. Um, cause we've, we've experienced so much already. We've been inspired so much. It's just a matter of, um, amplifying that and doing some kind of work and energy work around it. Um, and I would say again, making sure that people get acknowledged for the work that they're already doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? I, I, think that, I think that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. Okay. Carolina, how about you? I um, I I think yeah, like we're we're not here to like be superheroes or, or you know save the world, even though we we kind of are doing that. But um, I I feel like as community leaders, sometimes we we have to like just. Keep in mind that you know we we don't have the solutions to everything, and and I think it's always important to give the space to the people being affected, to be the voice of whatever they're trying to fight for because nobody's going to fight harder for their cause than somebody that's going through it. And I feel like as as community leaders and and you know working for for the for the work that we do, it's it's always important just to be there as like a support most of the times. But it's really just making sure that. There, there are more leaders that are being, you know, that are coming together, that are learning within our community, and that those leaders feel like they have everything that they need in order to become that voice for their community. So I feel like we, we do play a, a role in that part of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, just got a little ding. Um, no, that ding distracted me. Vanji, did you want to add anything while I'm recollecting my thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just echo what uh, Nemo and Carolina uh, both said about the importance of um, uh, amplifying uh, Black women and uh, women of color's work and recognizing them and the importance of representation. Um, you know, I had run for city council president here in Rochester because there were not I'll just be honest, there's really no people of color in leadership here in Rochester. Um, in the you know, city or, or county um, or school board, there's probably like one black man um, who is on the school board that is probably the only person of color uh, that is seen in leadership here in Rochester. And I, I think it was really important, um, even though that I, you know, some folks uh, in the movement do not see themselves as leader, leaders, they need to, they should. Because um, like with any kind of uh, civil rights or, or social justice movement, there has to be folks, and it's usually just regular, ordinary, everyday folks that rise up um, and help, you know, bring us, move us forward and to, to, to break, you know, break the, the chains that keep us oppressed. And, and um, especially for immigrants and refugees and women of color and black women and, and women in general, um, that we have to see ourselves in leadership positions. Uh, even if you think that you're not ready, even if you think that you're not experienced, even if you think people are telling you not to do it, do it anyway, uh, especially when they tell you don't do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so how, you know, we've been talking this whole time about um, all of you as, as either immigrants or refugees and as activists and organizers. Um, how, how do you think that part of your background, that part of your history, that part of your personal identity, being, having come from somewhere else, has informed your activism or your organizing um, in ways that might be different than, say, indigenous organizing or African-American organizing? Is there something distinct and unique about being an immigrant or a refugee that informs the work you do? So Nemo, you wanna take that one? Um, 
Yeah, so it, it, it's it's a huge, that's a big question, by the way. Because um, number one, it's like, I, there are all this, I live in South Minneapolis, and um, there are all these encampments. So the other day, um, I'm currently taking care of my mom, and the park near her house has this encampment, and it's mainly indigenous people. And... I, you know, I I go for a regular walks, and I ask them, "Hey, man, what what you, what do y'all need today?" And they're like pillows. So I'm like, "Okay, I gotta go get all these pillows." Then I was having a conversation with my mom afterwards, and you know, I I wanted to describe to my mom like the kind of like pain that I felt for what I saw. To the to the point where I was like, even though my mom lives in the United States, she has such deep connection to where she comes from. So I said to her, imagine if you've been displaced, completely displaced from like um, the rural parts of Somalia where she comes from. And then now you're like living in an encampment and like, you know, this is happening. So we, we literally just sat and we, we had this quiet moment where we both cried, but it was so quiet it's just like a certain level of understanding and that we, there's nothing that I can possibly say or do to take away the pain from indigenous people of the United States or just in, in this area, in South America, everywhere. Um, with that, with that said, um, as a new uh, African person that is a refugee, there is a different experience that also, people that are African-American have that I also cannot do anything about. And that is not my experience. And so it's, it's just like you have to know when to connect and when to be in solidarity and when to just stay in your own lane. Pretty much it. I, I think mm-hmm. it's a lot of observing and it's a lot of talking and communication. Some people just move too fast. Certain leaders, I'm like, no, you you, you don't know this person's experience. Mm-hmm. And listening. Stay, yeah, stay out of it. I'm like, and if you don't have the capacity, you do not need to be doing this kind of work. Yeah. Banji or Carolina, do you want to add anything to that question? If not, I have other questions. Carolina, do you want to go? I mean, you I can, can go, go ahead, Banji. <laughs> um, like Nemo said, like uh, I will never understand what it's like to be black in America. I understand my immigrant experience. I understand what it's like to be uh, Filipino in America and, and feeling discrimination and feeling the struggle and understanding oppression. Um, but it is very different for uh, black or indigenous people here in the United States because of the long history of enslavement and also, you know, genocide and oppression that these communities have experienced, and so it's it's ingrained in their in their history, in their genetics, and it's like um, I can empathize and I can understand the struggle, but I will never know exactly what that feels like. I understand my own history as um, a person from a, a country that's been colonized. Um, and fighting for our independence and, and, and being able to have that. But I think when you're continuing to be part of a, a, a community that is constantly being marginalized uh, and uh, invalidated and murdered, I can only, you know, I can, I can understand the anger um, that those communities have wanting and fighting so hard and protesting in the streets. And I get it And that. Um, my friend who is a, a white female, she asked me the other day, I think it was a couple months after George Floyd. Um, and she's like, I don't understand why you're not burning everything down, Vanjie, because I am so angry for you. And I'm like, good, <laughs> um, because we need to end this. This is, this needs to end for all of us, not just for, um, Black Indigenous people of color, but for also white Americans too, because this this is toxic for all of us. 
Carolina? I, I mean, I agree with, with Vanji and Nemo, and I think something that the part of listening, just really listening and having meaningful conversations with each other, I think is is something that's really important. And we should always, always be there to have a conversation like this. Like, you know, what are we going through? Like, what, what are your challenges? What are mine? Like, just having a conversation, I think, makes makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Um, I wanted to, so, so Nemo and Carolina, I wanted to direct this next question at you in particular, because you're both artists of, of, you know, various media. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing you talk a little bit about how you might see art being a, a part of your activism or your organizing or your work for justice. How does art figure into this? Carolina, do you want to start and talk a little bit about your project, which is fantastic? Yes, of course. And I, um, I love art, but I, there's like a whole team of us that, that created this project called Mirame, which translates to look at me. Um, they're really the artists, like they put together, um, this whole project. So, um, I, I feel like there's different ways of activism and one of them is art, art, music. Like there's, there's so many ways to show, um, or demonstrate like what you're trying to say or communicate to the world. And um, one of the beautiful things is like this project came about because I was angry, I was very angry at the fact that I was watching news where they were calling immigrants animals. And I mean, that's me, that's me, that's my family, that's my community. And I was hurt and I was angry. So I was like, okay, what can I do to let this out in, in, in a good way and, and actually make an impact? Um, and, and put something different um, out there. So that's that's why this project was created to really show how beautiful my community is, to show how working, how, how hardworking they are, how resilient. Um, and it was really to showcase all of the beautiful people in my community. Um, so yeah, that's that's part of, of the project. Yeah, it's a fantastic project. Nemo, how about you? Where does your art fit in? your poetry, your writing? Um, it, it, it's that, it, right now, I, I guess, I, if, if there is one particular project that I can point to that I've been working on is, um, not to say um, men don't do anything in within my community, but like, <laughs> they're, they're wonderful, great. <laughs> um, but the project that I've currently been super invested in has, it's called Mandek in Motion. Um, Mandek used, could have been the second name of Somalia, but it's like a, a woman's name, which means like a soul that's complete. So Mandek in Motion is um, a photography slash storytelling project about Somali women's uh, history in terms of clothing from the 1800s to now, because uh, uh, clothing carries so much history. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like one of those projects that I've just gotten lost in. It, it's like, it's so fascinating, particularly now, because it's within the diaspora, there is this um, acceptance of self within women and like just saying who you are and what you want to be. And so I, it, it's taking me like, I, Again, I feel like I'm an observer where it's like, to what point as an artist um, and also like a curator, this particular project I'm curating, like you, you get lost in the observation. Hmm. You're like, I'm looking at this. This is hmm. so phenomenal. And you stare at it for so long. Um, and once you see it into fruition, so this is, yeah, um, that's kind of what I'm working on. And part of it is so political too, like women's clothing in any parts of history. It, I, I, in, in doing this project, I've looked at different um, countries and different nations and different parts of history where what women were wearing and like how women were controlled through clothing. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, 
So I don't, I don't know. Like I, I appreciate that part of art and that part of uh, a lot of uh, a huge part of being an artist is being an observant. I feel like being a witness um, and finding a way to articulate that in with either words or visually or you know like bringing people together. Yeah wherever that means and yeah uh, and it's also i would say the most important part of it for me when i don't feel like i need to do a big project it's also just having everyday conversations that is the hugest part uh, of being an artist because like for me <laughs> with poetry i don't feel like i need to publish something to be poetic i could have a poetic <laughs> conversation with somebody could like yeah, I can help someone come into an understanding, vice versa, you know? Hmm. Yeah. I, I really like that idea. And I like what I've heard from all of you, um, what you've all said about how activism or organizer, you know, this kind of work to for, for social justice, to make our world a better place, can can and should start from where you are. You know where you are. You don't have to start with a grand idea, with a grand plan, with you know anybody else's idea of what activism is, or or you know um, with the grandest goals. But that you can start, whether it's through art or other kinds of activism, where you are and where you come from. I think that's really inspiring. So I am I am looking at the at the time here, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I know. Um, we all have other places to go today. So I wanna wrap things up here a little bit with, a, with three questions um, that I would like to pose to all of you. And the first one is, you can see it there on the screen. What would you tell someone, a young or inexperienced person, especially someone who is an immigrant or a refugee, who wants to make change? What advice would you give that young person? Vanji, let's start with you. Um, so I'll think about what, what, um, someone had said to me, uh, when I was a young person and didn't, wasn't really interested in activism. Um, and, uh, it was a peer friend who said, you know, Vanjie, uh, you are, uh, a brown, uh, gender nonconforming person of color, uh, immigrant, um, you can't just blend in. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to advocate for yourself, um, to have your own agency. And even if you are a young person who uh, is too young to vote, um, you still can be active. You have the right to uh, hold your government accountable. We all do. And, you know, coming from um, a country that ha had a dictator, basically, uh, if we want to prevent that from happening, we have to redress our government when we are displeased with um, them, you know, infringing on our, our rights. Uh, and I think that's important for all people uh, in general, and not just in the United States, but all over the world uh, to, you know, to have their own independence and their own agency and to be able to hold their government accountable. And you can do that either you know being at a rally at protesting and when you do turn 18 and you're eligible to vote register and vote and get other people to vote and talk about the importance of being civically engaged i think more people need to understand when you say i'm not political uh that's saying a lot about that you have privilege uh that you have so much privilege that the what's happening in the government does not affect you and so folks who are constantly um their rights are are up at the Supreme Court or, or um, you know, your, your voting is, um, uh, you know, as a, like, a, like a person who has a criminal record who is not able to vote, you know, things like that. So be involved, know what's going on, uh, get on TikTok. There's lots of educational videos <laughs> on there if you only have a 60 second time, uh, you know. <laughs> they're able to pay attention for 60 seconds and you learn a lot about how to get engaged and uh, especially for young people but you know it's it's not hard and I, it is um very fulfilling and i've felt i've felt really great uh to be part of my community and feel like making a difference and especially making a difference not just for myself 
but other people, and especially people who feel like they don't have a voice in the community. And then that's always what I felt really strong about is giving voice to folks who seem and feel like they're not heard. Yeah. Carolina, I'm going to I'm going to ask a, a version of that question to you. Um, but I'm going to change the the target of your advice. So what advice would you offer to an experienced activist or change maker, someone who's doing the work but might feel worn down or frustrated? How do you persist in the face of fatigue and setbacks and challenges? Where do you where do you draw strength to keep going? So how would you speak to your peers? I think we have to surround ourselves with people who are also like doing the same thing and are also, you know, have the values that we have. And we need to find a balance, like a balance and just making sure that we're like, not only like physically healthy, but like mentally healthy and finding help when we need it. Because sometimes we need extra help and we, we need to be okay with asking for help. Um, I think it's also important to remember that we, we can't do it all. Like we are human beings and we only have certain hours in a day. And also reaching out for that type of help when you can't do something or when you feel overwhelmed is something that many of us forget because we are so like passionate about what we do and we want to do it, but we also need to rest and we also need to, to need to take care of, of ourselves. Okay. And then I'm gonna wrap up with a final question for you, Nemo. And that is this one. What would you say to those who came before you? Either those who paved the path on which you now walk or those who have thrown roadblocks into that path. What would you say to your predecessors, your forebears? Oh, wow. Um, before I say anything with regards to that, like this is one thing I wanna say because I care about young people so much. So I want to go back to that question earlier of, with regards to young people. Number one, I'm going to say care about the environment. Two, learn to cook and grow your own food. Um, three, listen better and listen to yourself. Most importantly, like be kind to yourself. Um, and like at the, the point of like young people are not kind to themselves and i would say i'm plugged you know what i mean like as much as and i'm plugged um and find a way to be in nature so with that said to young people i, I cannot stress the point about um uh caring about the environment and learning to grow food and cooking um for yourself with the like my mom is my best friend and we joke so much and my dad too now like it took a while for us to become friends it's like i would i would say um you don't you don't always have to feel like you need to have power over people there's a certain level one of the reasons that i appreciate my mom so much is that um, she has this like childlike tendency and she can be humorous and she can just relax and chill with me. I appreciate that the most. I would mainly say that and so much information gets exchanged when someone is able to relax and not feel like they need to help you save the world. <laughs> if the world was gonna be saved, it would have happened yesterday the day before yesterday, <laughs> last week, eighteen <laughs> hundred. I don't know. So I'm like, we're not trying to save the world. <laughs> Can we just relax? So <laughs> within, that, <laughs> within that relaxing, it seems like it 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 really paves the way for um. It's just a wonderful relationship to take place, and uh, inter intergenerational relationships are important. Um, and young people sometimes when somebody arrives at themselves in terms of just being like, oh, I I found myself there is certain level of comfort that I feel within myself, then they feel like they need to know more about themselves. Mm -hmm. And so um, you don't want your child or your grandchild or anyone to resent you because you're not accessible mm -hmm. and you're power tripping. 
So there you go. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, thank you all. We are we are at time, so I'm going to wrap it up and and let you all go. But thank you so so much for coming today and sharing just these little bits of your stories. I know we could have continued for many many hours to learn more about you, but I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. And I just want to thank say you. before everybody leaves watch this space for information of the, for the upcoming um, Knowing Our Worth uh, conversations that are going to happen in November. Hope we'll see you that, at those and have a great afternoon. Vote if you can. Vote. Bye. 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 Thank you.